Product provided by Nintendo. The following video is not a paid for advertisement by Nintendo. The views in this video are mine and mine alone. The wait is over. Super Mario Odyssey is here and I couldn't be more pumped to dig into this bad boy. I've had this game well over two weeks now and I'm sure many of you at home are just getting into the groove of playing it. While I've always had a deep love for the 8-bit and 16-bit Mario titles, Super Mario 64 is the game that cemented my Mario fandom for life. It's an impeccably designed world with creative varied locations to explore, tons of secrets to unlock, and never-ending surprises mesmerized me, and I played that game over and over again. While I thoroughly enjoyed Sunshine, Galaxy, and Galaxy 2, the more recent 3D series has left me wishing for a return to a more open world for Mario to explore. That's why I'm so stoked about Super Mario Odyssey. This is the one that promises to bring us back to the glory days, or at least what I think are the glory days. Based on what we've been shown so far, this game seems to be the one meant for me. This is the Mario game that's going to save us all. This, my friends, is the chosen one. It's my Super Bowl. At least I hope it is. Very few Mario games have let me down so far, so let's hope this won't be the first one. Somehow, I doubt it will be. I mean, come on, it's Mario. Hey everyone, and welcome back to another brand new episode of The Completionist. Let's cut the chit chat this time. Super Mario Odyssey is out, it's here, and there's a lot to do and see. Let's begin. Yes! Right. Mario games used to be an event. When one would come out, you'd know that they'd do something to change video games forever. Think about it. The first Mario game solidified the platformer as a genre. Mario 3 and World took that idea to new heights with the overworld and tons of secrets. Super Mario 64 basically invented the 3D platformer. Sunshine, while weird, found a new take on Mario and put him somewhere we'd never even thought of. And the Galaxy series found a way to revive idolized the genre that 64 invented after years of being stale with its physics bending gameplay. But since then, Mario games have been great, but not revolutionary. They've met expectations at the very least, which is good, but it didn't blow people out of the water. That's what's so exciting about Super Mario Odyssey. For the first time in a long time, a Mario game feels like it's going to change the world. This is a triumphant return to form, a game so ambitious, it's almost hard to believe this thing even came out at all. Especially when Nintendo already released a large and ambitious Zelda title earlier this year. But now it's out, and I'm almost unnecessarily excited to put on my white gloves and red hat and dive headfirst into the pipe dream that is Super Mario Odyssey. The song Jump Up Superstar has been in my head since E3. I love it so much because, as a musical theater and acting nerd, this combines my love of performance with my love of Mario. Two worlds colliding. Here's the thing though, I know this game is going to take me a while to complete. Judging by what Nintendo has put out into the world, there are hundreds upon hundreds of power moons to find and collect. By the way, Nintendo, I feel like you're starting to call me out more and more with your not so subtle call to arms for completionists out there. First Smash 4 for Wii U and 3DS, then Zelda with the Korok seeds, now Mario with the moons. There's well over a dozen worlds to run around and I assume thousands of coins to add to my coffers. Oh, and secrets. There's gotta be some secrets. If there's any one thing that the Wii U and 3DS era games have taught me, it's that once I quote unquote finish Odyssey, I'll only be about halfway done. I can almost guarantee that there's going to be a boatload of new levels that open up after I bring Bowser to his dino knees. And if the Galaxy games have taught me anything, those extra worlds and levels are going to be a big old pain in my completionist ass. In short, I am in it for the long haul, but I am more than up for the challenge. Assuming this game is anywhere near as clever and creative as the other recent games, I'm gonna have an absolute blast completing this thing. And if I don't, well, I'm just gonna have to go full on Waluigi with this one. Yep. 
I'm gonna flip my logo upside down, steal a bunch of coins, yell wah, a bunch, and draw stuff on the nearest poster of Luigi. Take that, Mr. Eyeballs. Mario Odyssey is exactly as dazzling and graceful as it appeared to be in that very first reveal. The story is just as simple and charming as you'd expect from a Mario game, the music is delightful as you'd want it to be, and god damn is this game a shining beacon of color that pierces through the fog of the all bleak, sepia-toned action games. Smell that? That's the smell of refreshing aesthetics. Narratively, Super Mario Odyssey wastes no time getting into the good stuff. As soon as you hit start, Bowser shows up in, quite frankly, a dope-ass white suit, snags Princess Peach, and takes off with intention of marrying her. No, really. This game starts in the middle of a brawl between the despot who would be groom and our diminutive hero. The game takes no measures in setting up how Bowser hatched his plan or what led up to this confrontation. Instead, what's shown is only what's needed to be shown. Everybody gets the idea. Bowser's a lonely, single father, and he's finally looking to rectify that. Eventually, Mario's hat is destroyed in the fight, and he's knocked the hell out. Later, he's awoken by what appears to be a ghost inhabiting a top hat, who identifies himself as Cappy. He explains that Bowser has also kidnapped his sister, Tiara, and is traveling the world in search of several items for his not-so-consensual wedding. So, with Mario and Cappy officially teaming up, the two of them set off hot on Bowser's tail inside of Cappy's airship named the Odyssey. I do have one question, though. Does Super Mario Odyssey take place on Earth? I mean, there's some Earth-like stuff around, like oceans and land masses and islands and cities and real, actual humans? What world are we inhabiting here? Because it sure as hell ain't like any other Mario game we've ever seen before. Is this some parallel universe to our own? Has the world of the Super Mario Brothers movie seeped into our own, creating a bizarre, paradoxically combined real world and Mario world elements? Am I in this game? Are we all in this game? Is this the Mario universe that we're all living in right now? And while I'm questioning my reality and everything in it, what the hell is up with this one kingdom, New Dog City? It's supposed to be a metropolis that's heavily inspired by the original Donkey Kong, but it's infested with these real weird ass hyper realistic PS2 graphic human beings. Now don't get me wrong, New Dong City is actually one of my absolute favorite locations in the game, but every time I go there, I get a little freaked out by the inhabitants who all must commute daily from the uncanny valley. If Nintendo was taking inspiration from Donkey Kong, why not have all the city folk just be different types of monkeys? That way, we're staying within the urban themes, paying homage to past franchises, and remaining within the character design rules followed by every other NPC in the game. Why couldn't we have had a band made up of a gorilla on bass, a capuchin on drums, and an orangutan on trumpet? Yo, this shit writes itself. You could even still have Mayor Pauline be Mayor Pauline, but have Donkey Kong in the back rocking out on the guitar. That being said, each kingdom is so unique, beautiful, and charming, it makes you want to find out literally everything about it. Hey, what's over there? What's up that hill? What's in that hole? Why is that dude doing that thing he's doing? What's up with that car frozen in a block of ice? And more importantly, why does it look so goddamn realistic? Figuring out those questions and many, many, oh, so many more is what Super Mario Odyssey basically begs you to do with just how f gorgeous it is. I mean, Whenever someone complains about a Nintendo system being not as powerful as the latest Xbox or PlayStation, I point a finger directly at whatever Nintendo's latest release is. No one can make a game quite like Nintendo. Give just about any other developer the same system, the same level of tech power, and they'd never be able to come up with something even close to the beauty and charm that Nintendo packs in their first party games. What, well, you're gonna tell me that Rise on the Xbox One is worth anything on the Wii U? What, come on, tell me. Super Mario Odyssey is the best example of this by a mile. This game looks f***ing amazing. From the moment I loaded up the game, I couldn't shake a smile off my face. It's like this game was scientifically designed in a lab to make me happy. Hours and hours of grinning just based on what this thing looks like. My jaw hurts. Even Mario himself looks great. The little tubby guy who so often is the butt of jokes because of his little belly that I just want to poke is a stunner. Check out that mustache, that hat, that strangely hairless chest of an Italian guy. Looking good there, old buddy. 
Glad to see you join us in the HD era. When the little round guy plays dress up, things get even better. There are, dare I say, hella costumes in Super Mario Odyssey. Every kingdom has a unique outfit for you to try on. Work it all, Mario. You've got the look, you've got the swagger. Hit that runway and let them know. And the best part about this is that the people will treat you differently depending on what outfit you're wearing. Need to get into that oh-so-fancy club but aren't looking quite good enough? Don your best attire and boom, you're in! Just like real life! Or so I've heard. I, I wouldn't know. I've been doing nothing but completing games for most of my adult life. I don't go to clubs. I do have another complaint here though, and that's the loading screens. Sure, it's nice that they animated the entire interior of the ship you fly around in, but did they have to have your little hat friend spew out what can only be called tips during every single one? Cappy buddy, I already know how to butt stomp. I've known how to do that since Mario 64. You don't need to explain it to me every time I jump from kingdom to kingdom. Leave me alone, my dude. And as for the rest of you people out in these overworlds, I I know what the action guide is. Stop telling me how to use it. I know how to triple jump. I know how to ground pound. I know these things. Of course, in classic Mario fashion, the music is tremendous. Themed to each and every world, you can't even pretend that each song doesn't belong on an end of the year banger list. I mean, just listen to the music in Wooded Kingdom. This soundtrack is so good, it could be forcibly inserted into places it didn't belong and everybody would still just be fine with it. The music even plays a gameplay role. You know those 8-bit sections that everyone's been talking about? Well, every time that happens, a remix of the stage's music pops up and plays while you're flattened. It's a really amazing touch that Nintendo absolutely did not have to do. But because they did, it made Odyssey just feel that much more magical and special. It's rare that a game's visuals and music alone make me feel this emotional. But I'm not afraid to show my true colors. Mario makes me tear up. There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with curling into a ball and crying all night long. Nothing wrong with curling into a ball and crying all night long after eating three thin crust Domino's pizzas on a hardwood floor by yourself. That's what Mario does to us all, right? Am I right? Am I right, fellow youths? If you've played any other 3D Mario platformer, then you know exactly what to expect from and how to succeed in Mario Odyssey. This game is as smooth as Red Lobster melted butter sauce. Every aspect of it, from the controls, to the platforming, to the level design itself, feels extremely fluid and satisfying. First off, one huge fundamental difference between Odyssey and past Mario's are the lives. They, for the first time in a long time, are rendered unimportant. Nintendo has embraced the idea that collecting lives is meaningless. And as weird as it sounds, I kind of agree. Instead of focusing on collecting 100 coins to get a 1-up or getting a physical 1-up mushroom, every time you die in the game, you drop 10 coins from your collection. As a result, the importance of hunting down and collecting lives has been shifted to tracking down coins themselves, increasing the utility of what's usually a neglected collectible. It's like what Cory from the Nintendo Treehouse told me when we worked on that Super Mario Maker contest I did a few years ago. Collecting coins in a Mario game feels good, and for the first time, their end result feels just as good as collecting the coins themselves. As per usual, Mario is able to perform all the surprisingly limber acrobatic techniques that he's known for, but with Cappy on his team now, his moveset is changed up quite a bit. The main mechanics of Mario Odyssey involve Mario throwing Cappy out in front of him. You can have Cappy quickly return, or you can hold the button down to let him stay out longer, using him as a shield to protect you from incoming projectiles and enemies. Also, you can use Cappy as a platform. Running or jumping onto Cappy launches Mario into the sky, which means you can do some pretty freaking cool tricks. Hot damn does that feel awesome to pull off. Woo! But those aren't the only things Cappy does. Cappy can hijack the bodies of various NPCs in Mario Odyssey and possess them. As long as that creature or enemy isn't already wearing a hat of some kind, Mario can throw Cappy onto them and take them over like this. Jeez, 
Jesus Christ, these are just JPEGs of frogs. Did we just learn their history? Well, I guess none of that really matters now that we are the frog. Mario can possess over 50 different beings in this adventure, and all of them handle extremely different. Not to mention the fact that several puzzles or challenges can't be completed unless you're body snatching the right dude. Whether that be a Goomba, or a tank, or a mother flippin' T-Rex! Many of us might remember the motion controls in Super Mario Galaxy and how, at times, they were frustrating to deal with. That was my biggest gripe with the Mario Galaxy series. Now, some motion controls do make a return here in Odyssey, but you can circumvent those by turning off the motion controls altogether. However, the problem with that is doing so will actually preclude you from being able to perform certain secondary actions or moves. For example, moving the controller in a circular-like motion after throwing Cappy will make Mario throw his hat in a round AoE maneuver, similar to Link's spin attack. Moving the controller up and down will force Mario to throw his hat straight up into the air above him. You get the idea. And while many of these moves can be accessed in alternative ways that don't require the motion controls, some are straight up locked behind the waggle tech, like the super jump with the frog. But as a side note, make sure that you leave that HD rumble function turned on. There are certain items and objectives out there that require the use of the rumble, even though the game never actually tells you so. Those freaking jerks. I was stuck wearing that stupid sombrero in that damn room for like an hour. And then when I finally got it, it was on accident. And don't even get me started on that lack of two fishing. It rumbles when they bite it, but do you yank it back or do you let them go? Controller rumbles, you pull, but they run away. Come on, HD rumble, help me out here. In order to power the Odyssey and access to new kingdoms to explore, you've got to collect Mario Odyssey's main collectible, the Power Moon. Say bye-bye to shines and stars, and say hello to moons. Each kingdom that you visit has what I call plot-based moons, which you'll scoop up while accomplishing obligatory goals, like chasing Bowser, battling his wedding planning party, the Brutals, and the corrupted wildlife from the results from Bowser's evil deeds. But if you're just gonna go for the mandatory moons, you'll be disappointed at the length of Super Mario Odyssey. This game is all about exploring all of these very unfamiliar territories and rewarding the player for searching every nook and cranny. Each kingdom has tons of moons within them, and there are a fair amount of kingdoms to boot. There are a lot of really cool moon objectives that will hit you in all kinds of nostalgic funny places, and you can tell that the localization team had a fun time naming them too. On top of that, every kingdom you visit has its own purple regional coin currency that you can redeem for souvenirs, stickers, and outfits only available in that kingdom's Crazy Cap store. And playing dress up with Mario is one of the biggest appeals to Odyssey. They're a big motivator for finding all of these coins. And there are a ton of outfits. There's anywhere from one to three outfits per stage. So try to save up coins for both the regional and regular kind. While all of these outfits do not provide anything but a cosmetic change, there's a lot of nostalgia to be enjoyed here, as most of these costumes are from previous minor roles that Mario has had over the years. What's even cooler is that these costumes, should you wear them as a full set, will carry over with you in your journey into the 8-bit sections. However, mixing and matching them will just make Mario look like normal Mario. Damn, there goes my chance to express myself through 8-bit fashion. But not everything is peachy keen when it comes to Mario Odyssey. I personally have two really big problems with the game, with the first one being the moons themselves. Now look, it feels good to get moons. It feels just as good as it should when you get stars or shines. And I loved the fact that the game doesn't kick you out of the world you're in when you're collecting a moon, taking a page from Banjo-Kazooie. But the problem I have is each stage is filled to the brim with moons moons. This isn't an issue. There's a ton of fun unique moon missions that I wouldn't trade for the world. And there's a fair amount of challenging moons. More importantly, there's a fair amount of nostalgic moons for you longtime Mario fans. But the main issue I have is how you get some of these moons. A lot of the time, it just feels like talking to the right person or doing the obvious thing right in front of you just awards you a moon. Do you see that rainbow shining glow around that objective over there? Throw Cappy onto it, get a moon. Did you find the Koopa the Quick character and beat his friends? Great, here's a moon. He's on every stage, by the way, so we get used to running your ass off and getting good at throwing and bouncing your way to victory. Did you ground pound the floor? Moon. Corralled this sheep? Moon. Play that music track for Toad that he was listening for? Moon. Wearing the right outfit for this stage? Moon. Falling asleep? Moon. Being Mario? Moon. Sitting down in a park next to a dude? 
Moon. There are moons for everything that you do. Everyone gets a moon. You get a moon. You get a moon. You get a moon. I get a moon. Yes, it feels good to get a moon every 15 seconds. It feels like you're making a fair amount of progress. And it does feel purposeful, but it just seems way too easy most of the time. The difficulty comes to trying to find the location of the moons themselves rather than doing the task of getting the moon to appear. To their credit, a lot of these moons are fairly well hidden. You can talk to Hint Toad, who will reveal the location of where a moon may be. Or you can talk to Takatu, who will tell you the name of a moon, giving you an idea as to how to maybe find that moon. But this probably all stems from the fact that there's 836 moons in the game. Yes, you heard me correctly, 836 moons. That means that there's 836 unique objectives to do in the game. Amiibo was a pretty large component of Super Mario Odyssey, but I'm happy to report that once again, this content is not gated or will not gate your experience at all. If you simply get as many moons as you can, you will unlock costumes once you've beaten the game. But if you don't want to wait for that in the end game content, you can claim the costumes for free with Uncle Amiibo by using the corresponding Amiibo. Using the wedding Bowser, Wedding Peach, and Wedding Mario Amiibo specifically for Mario Odyssey will unlock each of their costumes right away for Mario. To add to that, you can also add other Mario Amiibo to the mix, such as Wario, Luigi, or Waluigi. But here's the thing, using the Amiibo with Uncle Amiibo gives you outfits as well as the location for a moon. But if you use the Amiibo without Uncle Amiibo, you'll gain a temporary power-up. Mario and other Amiibo type characters will make you invincible when you use it. Playing the Starman theme. You still take damage, but you don't lose HP. The Peach Amiibo grants you an additional 3 HP. And Bowser? Well, Bowser might be the most useful one of all. It'll outline for you where the nearest purple coins are. Now, people may hate on this, but I actually like this a lot, as I'm always that guy that ends up missing one or two coins on the stage, and I go nuts trying to find them. As per usual in Mario titles, the boss fights are very easy in Odyssey, but that doesn't mean they aren't fun. Every fight with Bowser feels satisfying and different, and at some point, you fight a boss that's essentially a Dark Souls boss. I kid you not. And you know what? It works. It freaking works. That's the big theme of Super Mario Odyssey. Here's a weird thing, and it just works. Now, the second big gripe I've got with this game lies in its level design. As someone who wholeheartedly loved ukulele, I admitted that the game had a lot of faults to it. And for the most part, Super Mario Odyssey is nowhere near that same level of design, nor does it deserve that kind of scrutiny. But I will say this, by the time I reached the Luncheon Kingdom, I was a bit over playing some of these levels. They look real awesome, and the transformations in Launching Kingdom are some of the best that the game has to offer, but it's got a lot of empty space with not a whole lot to really do. I feel like this aspect keeps up until the final kingdom in the game. It's not a deal breaker by any means, and it's just my own opinion, but I feel like it's a good 90% of a game until it gets a little stale. But I gotta go back to the fact that it feels good to find a moon, even if sometimes there are so many and they're easy to find, every single moon feels good. The chime just gets you pumped. Now imagine doing something impressive, incredible, hard to do, but fulfilling and rewarding, and you get that moon, and boom, that chime plays. You're gonna find yourself saying, all right, you know what? One more moon, I can do one more, I can do one more moon before bed. Okay, okay, yeah, that was good, yeah. Let's do another moon, one more moon. All right, screw it, 10 more moons, let's go. Let's beat this level, 100%. But on that note, I think I can safely say that for all those flaws, Super Mario Odyssey may be my favorite Super Mario 3D game. It's too early to tell, but I thought it met my expectations in a little bit more. What makes me hesitant is that it didn't smash it away from me. Well, that's my opinion so far as just beating the game goes. Let's see if completing it will make it any different. Let's rock and roll with this bad boy! When you defeat Bowser and save the princess, the credits will roll all the way to a very familiar place. That's right, boys and girls, this game is not over. We unlocked a new kingdom, and it's the Mushroom Kingdom from Super Mario 64. And the moons in this world, they're in the shape of stars. They even do that here we go chime from Super Mario 64. 
Now don't get too excited before you think you're playing a full-on remake of Super Mario 64. You're not. It's a modified version of the Mushroom Kingdom that features a lot of the same things, but it's obviously changed a lot. Like all Kingdom, there's a crazy cap store here as well, and your outfit is the original Super Mario 64 skin. That's right, you can become the original Super Mario 64 sprite that you've known and loved since you were a kid. It's a pretty rad thing if you ask me. This kingdom is filled to the brim with its own challenges and elements, including paintings to jump into, just like Super Mario 64. These paintings will take you to harder versions of the bosses you've already fought throughout the game. However, unlike all the other kingdoms in the game, the Mushroom Kingdom introduces something kind of never before seen in a Mario game, achievements. A large majority of the moons located in the Mushroom Kingdom are in fact based on the total achievements that you get across the game. Things like getting enough coins, doing enough jumps, throwing Cappy enough times, to even things like getting enough souvenirs, or costumes, or whatever. But don't freak out. Naturally, as you complete the game, you're gonna hit every single one. Either way, you're gonna have your hands full with all of the endgame content. And we haven't even talked about the previous worlds. Now that you've beaten the main game, some more things have become available. In your main menu, you can now access and play at any given moment any musical track that you've heard in the game on any stage at any time. Pretty cool, right? It's a great way to let you jam out to your favorite tracks wherever you are. Also, you may have noticed early in your journey that on every stage there are these big concrete blocks that seem to do nothing. Once you're done with the game though, those blocks become burstable. So when you throw Cappy at it, you'll end up expanding the number of moons in each world. Your completionist journey has only just begun. Welcome to my world. Now that your main adventure is over, Peach and Tiara decide to go on another adventure of their own, with the Toads of the Kingdom thinking that they've gone missing. Now's the time to try and find them. They appear in every stage, enjoying their own little vacation, just the two of them, and they'll reward you with some moons of their very own if you find them. Admittedly, Peach and Tiara look so cute. After beating the game, the Crazy Cap Store will also expand its inventory quite a bit. This right here is one of the best aspects of completing Super Mario Odyssey. The more you complete, the more you are rewarded. Every time you cross a certain moon threshold, you'll have the ability to purchase more costumes from the stores. But like I said earlier, you can also earn a majority of those costumes for free if you have the corresponding amiibo. But that doesn't mean you're not going to have a hard time grinding for that 9,900 199 coin spooky outfit. Commence the coin grindage. Cappy informs you as well that your adventure is not over because you have to earn more moons, and doing so will make you unlock another kingdom called the Dark Side of the Moon. And if you get even more moons than that, you'll unlock the Darker Side of the Moon. The Dark Side of the Moon acts as a big boss battle challenge hub where you'll have to defeat the brutal wedding party in a back-to-back -back fight without dying. Conquering this major feat will reward you with the royal King's hat and outfit, one of my favorite outfits in the game. But even that kingdom has its own set of challenge moons, and they're some of the hardest in the game. As a side note, one of my least favorite moon types to find in the game are the art challenges. And in the dark side of the moon, it's almost nothing but art challenges. Art challenges are where you go somewhere else in the game to a different stage or a different part of a world and find a specific place to ground pound to find a moon or star. And let me tell you, those are very hard and very cryptic to find. If I could just remove all those out of the game, I would. When you tackle the darker side of the moon, you'll experience a Champion's Road-like level, where you're going to have to conquer a very large and difficult stage. Personally, I played this stage after I completed a large portion of the game, so I had no problems tackling this level at all. My favorite part about this stage is when you're collecting the last multi moon at the very top. Cappy starts to get a bit sad and nostalgic, reminding you of how wonderful your adventure was together. Shut up, Cappy. You're making my eyes water. Beating this kingdom also rewards you with the invisible hat. Yeah, your outfit is completely invisible. It's kind of a weird thing to earn, but it's still pretty damn cool. So the big question, what happens when you get all the moons in the game? Getting every single one of these moons will turn the balloon sale of the Odyssey gold, with Cappy informing you that a new scary portrait of Bowser has appeared in the wedding hall. When you go back to that wedding hall, there are in fact two portraits. 
one that lets you relive the final moments of the game, but another that lets you fight Bowser again on the hardest setting. Beating this painting and sitting through the credits will net you a postcard, symbolizing a thank you for playing our game moment, similar to that of Super Mario Galaxy. This to me seems awesome. The game is acknowledging that you went above and beyond to reach the end of the game. Now, that's not enough for me. When you beat the game, you get access to buying more moons at the Crazy Cap Houses. When the game starts, you can only buy one moon per house, but when the game is over, you can buy unlimited moons. The question is, can I buy my way to 999 moons? And the answer is, yes. Yes, I can, and yes, I did. When you cap out at 999 moons, Cappy will congratulate you on getting those moons and says that there's something special waiting for you back in the Mushroom Kingdom. Upon revisiting the kingdom, you'll notice that there's a big ass top hat that's now resting on the top of the Mushroom Kingdom castle. Climb to the top of the hat and throw Cappy on a little ball sticking out of the top for this very cutscene. Getting to this moment feels incredibly rewarding. Sure, you don't get anything other than this cutscene, but for me, that's what Super Mario Odyssey comes down to. It's a celebration of almost all things Super Mario. God, just what a satisfying feeling when you've reached the end of the rainbow road that is this game. In my playthrough of Super Mario Odyssey, there were 76 hours of total playtime, 1,000 region purple coins collected, 43 souvenirs purchased from all of the crazy cap stores, 41 hats and 42 outfits acquired, 52 enemies taken control of with Cappy, 44,964 golden coins collected, 82 music tracks discovered, 999 power moons collected, and 92 different times that I jumped up and superstarred my way with Mayor Pauline at the New Dog City Festival. Super Mario Odyssey is the kind of game that your average Nintendo and Mario fan will love. It hits those expectations exactly as you want them to, and there's a lot of content to enjoy. It encourages you to complete the game and rewards you every single step of the way. The replay value of this game is through the roof especially with all of the fun things you can do with the photo mode. Trust me, you're gonna be running around taking as many photos as you can. I did have some gripes that I had a hard time dealing with, but as the game went on, one thing never changed. The stupid grin on my face never once went away, no matter how difficult or easy the game got. It'll be interesting to see what people think of Super Mario Odyssey in its years to come. All I can say is, Super Mario Odyssey has become my favorite 3D Mario game of all time. So does Super Mario Odyssey meet expectations? For a casual Mario player or someone who grew up playing Mario, I think it does. It doesn't go crazy out of the way to expand your experience a whole bunch, but if you're looking for a Mario game with a lot to do in it, yeah, it'll hit those marks for you exactly as you want. However, if you are a completionist, if you are someone like me who likes to go from zero to 100 and then some to get everything in the game, then this game is exactly what you want. There is so much content in this game and it constantly rewards you as you go along. This is a game that keeps on giving the more you put in and that to me is the most important thing about a game with a good completion aspect to it. Constantly rewarding the player for your progress as you go along to the point when you get to the end, when you get to that last moment, Yes, there are completionist-esque things that you are going to want to see and enjoy for your hard work in this journey. So, with that in mind, guys, I give this game my completionist rating of Complete It. Complete It! That's all time we have for today, guys. So please, as always, let me know about today's episode somewhere on the internet. A big thank you to the fan at E3 who gave me this visor. They ran out of hats when I finally got my chance to get one, and he gave me his. He wouldn't give me his name, but I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. I tip my hat to you, sir. 
Uh, if you're new here and you like today's video, hit that subscribe button, like the video, let me know what you think. And if you missed last week's video, which was on Tenchu, you can click or tap right here on screen. I've been Gerard, a big thank you to these guys over here, and I'll see you next week for another brand new episode of The Completionist. Bye.